Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Art Forum SF, co-sponsored by the South Asian departments of UC Santa Cruz, Berkeley, and Stanford University, we welcome you all to SALA 2023. The topic for this session is Arrange to Love, with our guest speakers, Jasbina Aluwalia, KG Dhaliwal, Shalini Singh, and Anjali Jhangiani. who are in conversation with our very own Ritu Marwa, who many of you know. <laughs> Just a few house rules before we begin our session. Please put your phones on silent and no flash photography or recording. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let's give this panel a big round of applause. And no flashing also. So I'm, we have one mic, so I'm going to put it on the stand so we can move around. And so, um, you know, we all live in the valley, and um, we have to be very woke. And I am usually not woke, so I have written down everything to control my non-wokeness. <laughs> so, so we know that we live um, in a world which is highly mobile. We have a lot of young people who travel from India and work in the valley and uh, behavior and values are mingling and new dynamics are being created. There's also the internet and so modes are changing faster than ever between uh, in the world. You, you know, there was, in my time there used to be a lag. Uh, we used to try to be uh, more Greece-like but we were not really Greece-like. So in this uh, new world, uh, the responsibility of arranging relationships has been taken on by the people themselves and not their parents. So today we have with us two people, Jasbina and Shalini, that's Shalini, and this is Jasbina, who uh, are in the business of love. Uh, Shalini, embroider of trustworthy relationships, is the founder of And We Met, an Indian matchmaking service for urban Indians living in India and overseas, anywhere in the world, looking for long-term relationships, meaningful relationships, uh, whether it is companionship, live-in, marriage, you know, the whole gamut. And Jasbina, whom I have known for a very long time, has been doing this in the Valley as an Indian-American attorney turned matchmaker. She's the founder and president of Intersections Match by Jasbina. It is a personalized service. And uh, I uh, jokingly said, you're the Seema auntie of Los Altos. And she said, <laughs> no, don't say that. I am not. And uh, so, but she, she uh, talks to uh, Indian singles in US, Canada, UK, and she has the best of East and West. Um, interestingly, on our panel is also Roshan, who launched Schmooze, a meme-based dating app the fastest growing Gen Z dating app. Roshan spent time about the US understanding the dating landscape and having witnessed firsthand the transformative power of laughter and connection. He will offer us insightful perspectives, if he's still awake, on the fusion of technology and love in today's landscape. He's a seasoned chief of staff, Purdue grad, and has spent time as a PM at UKG. Who do you think is Anjali? <laughs> Anjali Jhangiani is a second generation Indian American who chats about arranged marriage with fellow residents of the Tony neighborhood of Ruby, Ruby Hill. So we have a gem amongst us, a gem of Ruby Hill, but nobody knows that she was a renowned Kathak dancer and was the principal lead in Chitresh Das dance internationally, and she has also uh, founded a non-profit. But also she used to work in the Valley uh, for uh, Sun? Sun, Oracle, Salesforce. So there you go. She is uh, a converted gem. She's been just polished. <laughs> So uh, we have a very interesting panel. We will have the perspective of two people who are in the industry um, uh, dealing with uh, um, matches across globally and then an internet and then a mother of two. And I am a mother of two. I have two boys. She has two girls. And so I'm going to uh, kick it off with asking Shalini what do you think is fundamental for creating a successful relationship? It's a very simple answer. 
Yeah. Before I respond, thank you so much. I haven't thought that there would be interest for this topic. So thank you so much for being here. And um, I'd really like to thank Sala for actually conducting this. Um, what's fundamental, I think, is very, very simple. It's communication. Um, I think if you just communicate and express, that keeps the relationship going. So that's what my answer would be. And um, I think one of your beliefs is that trust is done. I guess trust is given, you know. So um, it's like when you ask people, what are you looking for a partner for a long-term relationship? So they say trust, honesty. I think that's given because that should be given, right? Well, but. You know, um, No, so that's where I said, so that's where I am saying communication is going to be a very, very, I mean, if you know how to communicate, so yes, doc, Dr. Varghese did say that they are family secrets, and, um, you know, if you do have, because there are people who may not want to be in somebody's family because of health reasons, yes. so I guess that is, it depends on the two people, okay, or uh, the families on how they communicate, how they make you trust each other. So I think communication is, you know, it's the foundation for anything in a relationship. Absolutely, I agree with you. Um, communication um, is possible more and more as the people are spending more and more time on the internet. So do you think that how much time are they spending, uh, Jasmina? Like, are they spending a lot of time just talking before meeting up? I think they should be. Whether they are or not, I think that's highly variable. So, um, one, I want to you know, agree and endorse communication being so important. And I think that we just touched on something extremely important also, which is trust, but also um, assumptions. M uh, to me, the biggest enemy of great relationships is assumptions, okay? And that's relationships, romantic and otherwise, right? We all kind of jump into assumptions, especially in this information loaded world, that can really um, deter us from actually being in meaningful, mutually fulfilling relationships. So from that perspective, I, um, you know, I think when you're saying, you're saying how much time are people I'm spending? I'm that I find that you know, the younger generation yeah. are happy to just keep communicating on the internet. Oh, yeah, not, yeah, not some are. Well, n I don't think the ones that are getting in relationships are doing that. I think the ones who are kind of cycling through and kind of not getting in relationships are doing that. I mean, I think it's really important to remember online is a tool. The goal is to get in an in real life relationship. And I think that can get lost. It's an astounding number, and this is pre-pandemic numbers. Mm -hmm. A third of people who are dating online, we're never meeting anyone, right? It's yeah. kind of like cycling through. And to be candid, and all due respect to the apps, but really the, the apps are gamified to kind of keep you online, right? Um, and so are the sites and everything. So I think one needs to take ownership with respect to that when they're dating and know why they're dating. And if they're dating as a means to be, you know, find a relationship in real life, they need to act accordingly. And there are a lot of things to do in that regard, one of which is to communicate in a way that you're sharing what's important to you and really get to those in real life conversations because there's only so much you can do online. Roshan seems to be shaking his head very vigorously. Sorry about the mic cord here. Yeah, I mean, I disagree. Uh, I don't disagree with the overall point that you should be meeting online, but I disagree with the statistics. A third of people on dating apps are not meeting anybody. A large portion of the world that is intending to meet people in real life and are dating are not meeting anybody either. It's not as though it, just because you're single and in the world you're meeting somebody. Same thing goes for dating apps. And for dating apps, they're not gamified to keep you there. They want you to meet somebody, otherwise people delete the app. One of the biggest and most successful dating apps we have is Hinge, and Hinge's real differentiator is their slogan designed to be deleted. 
So the, it's difficult in the dating app industry to diagnose whether it's positive churn on the app, meaning people are meeting and leaving the app as a result, or if it's negative churn on the app because people are getting frustrated and not meeting anybody and leaving as a result. That is a pain point and something that people in the industry look to get more information about. But the idea that dating apps goal is just to keep you on the app, I think is false. So, okay, so one, I think apps are a great tool. Like, we will put our clients on online dating sites and apps. So I'm no, in no sense saying there's something, you know, evil about apps. In no sense. Um, that all being said, I think it is important to understand. I, I don't know about every single app, but I know apps like Hinge, like the larger apps that have been established, okay? Let's say that we hop, let's say I hop on an app. Let's say I'm married, but let's say I'm not married and I decide to hop on an app, okay? What's gonna happen is, is that as soon as I go on that app, they're gonna, the app, right, the larger apps are gonna throw me highly, you know, let's just say conventionally attractive people, okay? And they're gonna throw me these conventionally attractive people with the goal of me saying, ooh, cool, this is a great place to find conventionally attractive men, right, since I'm hetero men, and so, you know, let me sign up, right? Let, Here's my credit card, let me. And then when I do that, what's gonna happen is on a larger site that has had years of, re like years of um, data collection on who's swiping right, who's left, swiping left, what they will do is everyone is kind, everyone who's a part of that site is gonna be either assigned, like they're, they're 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 40, meaning that if I'm a 90, okay, then next time I'm on the site, after I put my credit card there, after I'm a member, I am gonna be shown people who are 85 and up in terms of the strata that they have devised based on the empirical data, right, of who's swiping right and on what, okay? So based on people swiping right, and it, does anyone not understand what swiping right means? I, 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 you know, uh, Tinder, Tinder, you know Tinder, you have the photograph and then you uh, swipe, uh, you know, this way if you like or you don't like or whatever. Swipe right means, I'm going, to, I'm going to also add something to it. You know what, I am compulsive iPhone and I think everybody here is like me. And for nothing else, I'm constantly swiping Facebook posts which no one has updated, but I'm swiping through Facebook and Tinder is addictive too, I agree with you. No, no but the point, no, the point isn't, no, the point isn't, okay. So it's not, so first of all, I wanna be clear. We will put our clients who, you know, on online dating sites, I am in no sense saying online dating sites are evil or online dating apps. In no sense they are a great tool for connecting people who otherwise wouldn't meet. So I wanna be clear with that. That being said, right, I get the lawyer in me has to do the research, right? So that being said, we need to understand what happens with at least the highly established apps that have been around for years. As we can imagine, we're all sitting in the valley, we know that people have data, we know that data is looked at, right, and it's monetized. So from that perspective, what's happening is, let's just say, so basically Tinder has the data, right? Or Tinder, Hinge, name, Bumble, whatever. They have, oh yeah, Harry, <laughs> coffee meets bagel. So they all have the data on who's swiping right. Like, what are you swiping? You're swiping right, okay? So they're seeing this data, and based on the data, okay, Jasbina says, I'm gonna, I wanna go ahead and sign up, right? So they're gonna, after they show me highly attractive, conventionally highly attractive men, I put my credit card down. Then they're gonna assign Jasbina. Jasbina's a 10, I'd say, or a 50, right? Whatever it is, it's gonna be some number, we're Silicon Valley, it's right, metric, okay? Some number, and then let's say they assign me an 80, okay? So that means that when I next time log in on the app, I am gonna only see men who are 75 and above. I'm not gonna see the guys who are below that. I'm gonna see 75 above, and they're gonna keep me on that app. Charlene, yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, and maybe, uh, so I'm building and we met uh, it's not an app yet okay I've just started building it it's on the web uh, we don't and um, before I talk about and we met uh, you know there was somebody who said for young people I think relationship can be found at any age it's nothing to do with young or old so I'm very very clear on that whenever somebody says love can be found when you're young or when you can it can be found it can be found many times so uh, I'd like to just 
uh, clarify that, and that's what we do at ANVIMET. Uh, there were a couple of things, you know, um, so it's slightly digressing with what she said, but you know, talking about assumptions, talking about attractive thing, because that I think as Indians or South Asians, we are told what kind of a partner you should look at. Okay, needs to be good looking, needs to be, if it's a man, needs to be good looking, needs to be highly educated, needs to be earning this, uh, you know, a certain income, um, needs to be tall, needs to be slim, all right, and for the girl, she needs to be pretty, she needs to be fair. Uh, the reason why actually I built and we met is a personal story. Um, I come, I'm a North Indian, and uh, by my complexion, you know that I am not fair by the standards. And from 19, from the age of 19 to the age of 26, I was shown, um, not men, but I was introduced to parents of boys. And um, my mom would call, and she would, and they would say, um, no, we disapprove. You know what they would say? I would say it in Hindi and then I'll translate it. They would say, Larki kali hai, right? And which means the girl's dark, all right? And that's the reason I couldn't have an, uh, so what happened was, now you think of what goes through my parents' mind. Uh, my father was uh, on the darker side, right? And that's how I am. And I am doing very well professionally. I was working for a company called Cisco Systems. I'm traveling around the world. I am doing great, but this is what's happening in my personal life. And that's, and um, you know, I think that's where the seed came into me that I need to build a service where anybody who comes uh, feels happy and good to be, to find someone, because finding a relationship, I think we live one life, and what Dr. Ibrahim also said, that you know, uh, a life's like, it's terminal, right? We forget that, and we forget to enjoy our relationship. So I'm saying if you want to stay single, stay single. But is when you look for a partner, does it have to be how good looking they are? If you're looking for something long term, does it have to be how much are they earning? I think the whole thing is changing. The man can be shorter than the woman. The man can earn lesser than the woman. The women are doing so well today, all right? You don't. For Indians, if you are a girl and you don't get married by the age of 30, you are written off. It is very, very difficult. Why is that so? You know, I mean, so, so there are a lot of things that's what we talk about on and we met. And I have a question on that, uh, which I think uh, you can answer, and I know you wanted to say something else as well. Yeah. Are ch parents failing their children then? Are we, if they yeah. are saying, wo kali hai or wo whatever, but when we go on the app, you know, uh, a beauty lies in the eye mm -hmm. of the beholder, and you like someone who's chubby, uh, like me, and uh, you know, that's what you like. My nani used to always sing this song at, at every wedding. Yeah. You know, like whoever likes you will take you. Yeah. Actually, before you respond, just one yeah. thing. I just, you know, I, I can at least talk about it. Parents, you know, we are always trying, as children, we are trying to always please our parents. So if the parent says Kali hai or she's dark, you always think about it if you're finding a partner yourself. So, uh, so now I'd like to hear what Ali has to say about it. Yeah, that. so first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you for staying here in the scorching heat. And I hope this topic resonates with a few of you. And I do see some young people in the audience. So thank you for sticking it out. But one of the things that I will say to some of the adults who have young children or who are going to be children of age, marriageable age, um, what resonated with me growing up in this community, my sister and I grew up in a small town in a uh, suburb of Chicago. Went from nursery school to college there, and my sister and I were the only non-Caucasians. And where I think the fact that my sister and I both married Indian men was like, my father was doing cartwheels, I think, when I told him I wanted <laughs> to marry Sushil. Um, only because I was anything but Indian. I was your normal American girl. And does that mean that that's a bad thing? No, it's not. I didn't ask to come to this country or be born in this country, but my parents made that choice. And when we came here, we wanted to be like any other person or any other girl in the community. And what my father was fantastic at, and my father was amazing, is he raised two girls. He emancipated his daughters. And what I mean by that 
is, is that there was nothing that my sister and I could not do that my father did not approve of. In fact, before we even got our driver's license, my dad made sure that my sister and I knew how to change the tire. He says at any given time, you're gonna get a flat tire. If you don't know the basic mechanics of this vehicle, how are you going to own that you are capable, you don't have to be a damsel in distress. You have to figure this out and you cannot sit here and say, I don't know how to change a flat tire. But when I, going back to when, you, when we as a community, and this is all in South Asian community, we've all emancipated our daughters. And what I believe that we fail to do is domesticate our sons. And what I mean... <laughs> On, the, on this point, just one minute, I have to let Roshan, at this point, who choked on his water, say something. In today's relationship, are the boys doing the cooking when they live in with a girlfriend? Who's doing that? No, no, no. no. Let, let, him, let him answer. Let him answer. I, I, un I understand your statement. I'll respond to your statement. Uh, no, no one is cooking. That's why DoorDash exists. Um, <laughs> No, my answer, I totally agree with you. If there's any women in here that are extremely tall and making more money than me, I have no mental issue with it. If you'd like to talk to me after, I'll be around. I'm happy, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Um, on the topic of domesticating your sons, I, I, uh, I understand your overall point. Um, I do think it's a good one. I think it is a reason that uh, then the daughters look towards the apps because that's part of the disconnect um, that may keep the younger generation away from something like arranged marriage. If you have a daughter who's extremely independent, uh, who lives a life on her own, who feels like there's something, there's a side of her personality that her parents don't understand, or similarly for your boys, if there's a side of that personality that you feel like your boys don't understand, if you grew up in a very Caucasian world and you feel like your parents don't fully understand what that looks like, it may be hard for you then to trust in them to find you a partner that can meet all sides of what you're looking for. Yeah, you wanted to say something. I love that. Yeah, I did. Actually, I want, I want to endorse basically what was said by everyone here in so many levels. But I want to, Anjali, what you mentioned is part of why I'm doing the work I am. I think Ritu has mentioned I'm a lawyer turned matchmaker, right? So I obviously invested heavily in a lot of things before I decided to do the work I'm doing now. And there's a reason for it, okay? I feel like this is an exciting time in this industry. I literally came from San Diego where I was hobnobbing with others in the industry who share backgrounds similar to myself. They were killing it in the corporate world as lawyers, as, as you know, executives, and they chose to do the work that we're doing now. And there's a reason, okay? This is a point in history, which you touched on, where like you said, I, like you, grew up with two sisters. When our parents came over, they decided to release some of the thoughts about what women should do, what men should do. We also learned to change tires. We also, there was never a question in my parents' mind that these two are, these kids, they want to go to college. We, they, first of all, they don't have the choice. They need to go to college. Secondly, they really probably should be getting advanced degrees. That was not, I mean, that was like, you know, where we were headed. There wasn't a, okay, we have three daughters here. Should we get them educated? Uh-uh, that wasn't there, okay? So I do agree. Now, I want to speak to the domesticated thing, okay, for a minute. Because I have in my, at our house, we have two boys. I'm a boy and a girl, so we have our own little lab with a boy-girl gender things. And so what I want to say about the domesticated is I, Anjali, you'd be interested to know probably that I interviewed a family, family, family marriage therapist, right, as part of what we do. And one of the things she mentioned is nothing will change until people raise their sons differently than they are doing now. Now, hold on. I want to say, say one thing, though, because I don't want men. I have a son at home. I have a husband I dearly love. And here's the thing. Okay, just really quickly. This isn't about on guys, because actually I think a lot, our guy clients are looking for equal relationships, so let's not make it. Okay, so I agree, we are all looking for uh, equal relationships amongst us, we are looking for equal relationships, but we cannot forget there's a transition happening in which these relationships, you know, like you don't have lifelong jobs, you know, you work for HMT, when you complete 25 years, you get a watch. Uh, we are no. We are changing careers. We are transitioning lawyer to matchmaker, and uh, Cisco executive to matchmaker, 
and um, um, uh, um, son, and you know she's a gem. I am. Uh, I I'm a business. <laughs> and so um, I also changed my career. So are we now looking at, since our careers are becoming, you know, you change marriages, are we expecting the institution of relationships? I'm not supposed to say marriage. So the relationships, are we expecting that our kids will have a five-year relationship and like, you know, will it change? It, <laughs> Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a two-second comment and then I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> Hey, I have been brief. Uh, that was me, I guess. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, to end the conversation on domesticating your sons, I just want to give a quick clarification that I feel like may help this audience. Domesticating your sons does not mean teaching them how to cook. It means teaching them emotional intimacy. Yes. There's a big difference. Um, so I just want to clarify that. Uh, if you teach them how to cook, someone in the house will die. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll pass it to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, firstly, I just want, you know, relationships not about domesticating. So we need to know that, you know, it's financial compatibility, it's your sexual compatibility, it's your emotional compatibility, and we don't discuss that. As long as, how long are the relationships lasting? If they last for five years, so be it. If they last for 50 years, so be it. How does it matter? Right? You need to be happy. Both of you need to be happy. Both of you need to be in a healthy relationship. So uh, I think divorce is a situation. If you do get married, okay, and it doesn't have to be a label, a lifelong label. Um, so, yeah, so that's what. So, you know. Yeah, and also, you know, somebody had talked about marriageable age. I would like to repeat again there is no marriageable age. Uh, no, no. Uh, well, there's a floor to marriageable, marriageable <laughs> age. Let's make that clarification. Uh, as far as the only comment I have on how long relationships are lasting, and then I'll, I'll pass it off. I'm here more to talk about the technology and dating side. Right. But since I have the mic, I will say to the group, I think it's irresponsible to marry somebody if you've not lived with them first. Absolutely. And I think that that's a very big component of why people are stepping away from arranged marriage. Just, just, and thank you for saying that because I think one of the things that all of us as Indians first generation, I think it's the hardest for some of them, only because when you left India, you left at that time and India has evolved and India has grown. Society has now been far more open-minded through the internet and just through social media itself that you would be far more surprised that if you go to India, probably the children there are far more progressive than the Indian children that you are raising in this country. So to add, just to add to that, I'm just gonna remind everyone a little bit about, I think, what uh, Shalini added to. When our grandmothers and great-grandmothers and our grandparents were in relationships, if they were in an abusive or a non-love relationship, they stayed in that relationship for three reasons. One, for society reasons. Socially, it was unacceptable. Second, it was economically. The woman did not have the means to survive on her own. And third is because they couldn't go back home. They didn't have a place. They didn't have uh, any form of emotional connectivity or somebody that they can reside with. In today's generation, because we've emancipated our daughters, and this is where I'm gonna tie this back to the domestication of our sons, that he actually, the latter part was correct, is because our daughters today don't need the financial income. Our daughters today can, society accepts divorces. Society is okay if you're single. Society is okay if you're in a non-hetero relationship. And third, the only thing that today that probably a man, and I'm not saying the only thing, I'll take that back. <laughs> One of the major components for a man to provide a partnership and a relationship with our daughters today is to be emotionally connected. If you don't understand your daughters and you don't understand her needs and you don't understand what she wants out of her life, that causes conflict, that causes an imbalance, that causes where our daughters today will probably walk away. And I'll give you an example is when both of you are doctors, you go off and you're, you're a surgeon, you come home, She's cooking, she's managing the house. 
You have children added to that. That's a hell of a lot more pressure upon her. It's Tuesday, the garbage has to go out, and she's reminding her partner, you need to take the garbage out. She's asking herself, why do I need to ask him to do this? This is his home. He knows the garbage needs to go out on Tuesday. Why do I have to remind them to do this? So he needs to be responsible and an equal partner in managing that home. And that's, that's what I meant by domestication. I, no, no, I understand that domestication, uh, you know, has a completely new meaning. But the other thing is that when our um, young people are dating or old people are dating, are they dating intentionally to have a long relationship or are they just dating for dating? And I'm going to pass this to Roshan. Yeah, I mean, I don't think people are walking into looking for a relationship, looking for marriage, or evaluating on that criteria. I think that comes after time. I think people are looking for connectedness in a world that is more inherently uh, disconnected. You know, I think there's a lot of people sitting at home uh, who want to feel connected to their peers, who want to have a partner to share their life with, to experience that emotional intimacy with. But they're looking for other things that are markers that they will initially get along through the first two or three conversations. They're not thinking about long-term plans because I think people are looking for inherently low-stakes environments when they're young. I think people want to meet somebody casually in a low-stakes environment where they can learn because they're learning also to form serious, deep relationships for the first time. And that's where uh, a lot of these dating apps can come to play. Also, I, I think we should take questions from the audience at some point. Uh, I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a quick question for you. Uh, when, um, when you are looking for emotional intimacy, can you get it uh, with someone who's just online? Yeah, I'm, uh, yes. I think the answer to that is yes. I think for each person it's different. My source of emotional intimacy is my dog. Um, but for a lot of people, that's not true. We're seeing a huge uh, opening of AI dating where people are dating AI models. Uh, Replica has come out, which is meet your AI girlfriend. They have 10 million users, 2 million daily active users, half a million people paying for the higher tier of the service. And they're going online and they're chatting with bots and they're... Um, going about it that way, that has a lot of challenges with it. I'm not saying that that's great for society. There's some human connection elements to be said there. But for people, especially South Asian children, growing up in a home where they may be looking to find emotional intimacy somewhere else, being online is widely accepted by their peers. It is the widely accepted form of dating. I'm not talking about robots, I'm talking about dating apps. It is the widely accepted form of dating and it allows them to date on their own terms. And, but yeah, AI girlfriends are starting to exist. So AI girlfriends in the sense that you uh, just talk to her and then is that cheating? So suppose you have a girlfriend and then you have this online girlfriend who is a robot and you are talking to her about your intimate do you want to comment on this one? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, you talked about emotional intimacy, and I want to talk about that. And somebody talked about assumption earlier. You know, we just assume that when we enter a relationship, right, uh, there's a lot of pressure, and more so now, because we started living in silos, and we're living in nuclear families, uh, whilst I think most of us have grown in, you know, uh, joint families, larger families, communities. So that pressure, you know, we had different people for different reasons, right? So we had somebody who could help us emotionally. We could go to somebody for socially, so all of that. But what's happening today, when couples are living together, they have so much of expectations from each other, and that's where it's going down. Emotional intimacy actually also comes while you're growing up, right? How your parents behave with each other, how are you with your extended family and friends, it doesn't come immediately. So I come back to my earlier thing when you asked when you started this, is about communication. I think what we forget to um, you know, uh, empower, each other is, let's be open to communication, let's be open to discussing what, where we don't feel good about things, uh, let's talk about ourselves. Even when you're entering a relationship, if I ask and I talk to a lot of people, we know what we want from the partner. Do we know ourselves? Okay, would you date yourself is I always ask this question. If you wouldn't date yourself, why do you expect someone to date you? 
No, but if you don't feel good about yourself, Ritu, why do you want someone to date? I mean, that's being unfair. Would you date someone uh, who is vulnerable, who is not confident enough? You wouldn't because that person becomes a chore for you. You're not there for that. So how many of us are talking about that, right? And then why, so whilst you are in your teens and in your early 20s, you are dating actually to explore yourself. You know a lot when you date. Now, when you go out for a date and you get feedback, you're not open to, you know, when you go for a job and it doesn't work out, right? You always ask for feedback. And that's what I tell people, ask for feedback. Why didn't this work out? If you're looking for something substantial, so, so, you know, so I have very, very different views on how we look at relationships. So, um, the thing, uh, uh, somebody said we should ask a question. Somebody yeah. is keeping time we and, time. oh, we still have time. Can I just yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think, um, I love that you said feedback, actually, Shalini, because that's a big part of our process, actually, um, to speak to feedback, because there is, as everyone who's dated at all, anyone here in the room who's dated knows that people are not terribly transparent in the dating world. I'm sure some of you heard the term ghost. I'm sure, you know, ghosted and this kind of thing. And I don't think it all is coming from anywhere maleficent. I actually think that people are actually, no matter, confidence and vulnerability are not uh, oxymorons, okay? Every human being is gonna be vulnerable. So we're not gonna to try to not be vulnerable. I think it's important to actually understand where we can be vulnerable and, you know, and just, you know, date in a way that understands we have vulnerabilities and understand that we you know have a healthy self of esteem despite that right so kind of uh you know i can go on and on about this but the bottom line with, with respect to feedback is this okay i agree it's super important to get feedback i think that it's challenging for people to give feedback to others. They don't want to hurt each other. They don't want to, right? So oftentimes people say, oh, there's no chemistry or something. We, I think with real feedback, what we do for our clients is go underneath the hood, right? No chemistry only takes you so far. Let's understand a little bit more. So meaningful feedback is super important, but it's not that easy to get from somebody for, for various reasons, right? So I think that's important. But, and that's where apps are a great tool, but not having a bridge from an app to actually, um, you know, understand things out there can be, you know, can be, can be difficult. I'm going to take this because Rochelle is shaking his head very vigorously on that. But I am going to take your point, Jasmina, about, um, you know, I forgot what was my bridge um, when you said something. But the thing is that when you take a decision, either you take the decision very consciously. Uh, you know, there's that book, How We Decide, written by a Berkeley professor, which says that the reasoning that you use to buy a painting is very different from the one you use to buy a refrigerator. So you want this much capacity, cooling, you know, all the technical things, but when you go to a painting, it has to speak to you emotionally. So when you are d meeting someone, you might have all these criteria that your parents have given you, but then when you meet the person and you talk to them, it can be completely non-rational, right? And so I forget what you said that sent me on this track, that sometimes, um, People don't follow the logic, you know? So you guys, both of you have questionnaires and to, get, to ask each other, you know, you are self-analysis of who I am. And many times I tell my son, I know what you want more than you know. And that's very, that's actually, okay, so that's very common, right? Because we really buy with emotion, if you think about it. And everyone in the Valley who's selling anything knows yeah. that, right? So um, emotion is, so I say that both the heart and the mind belong in a decision as high stakes as a partner, right? So that is why I, so to back up, okay? We could, why was I shaking my head like this with, with um, you know, the analogy to Auntie Sima? Well, this is why. Because I, as a similar, right? As a, someone who born and raised in the US, um, two parents immigrated from abroad, I think both the East and the West have something to teach us about think, relationships. Do you think that wait, you, no, no, what okay, wait. said about the heart, Oh, okay, go yeah, yeah. Yeah. You used the heart and the mind, both? So, so I mean, yeah, yes and no. I think the problem in today's society, quite honestly, is 
there's a lot that happens in the home environment where the parents are constantly telling the children one thing and then they're expecting a different result. So for example, if you tell the child, don't ever lie, don't ever lie, and the phone rings and you tell that child, tell them I'm not at home. Well, what are you, what are you, what are you, you're giving your children mixed messages. So if you're trying to raise a, a young child at home and you want them to learn to communicate so that they can find a partner in life, you have to embed those type of qualities at a much younger age in your, in your understanding your children. We can all say as mothers we understand our children, but I can promise you, first, second generation children will tell their parents what the parents want to hear. You all did the same thing of when you all were growing up. You only told your parents what they wanted to hear just so that you had an opportunity to do what you want. So unless you open your hearts and your mind to allow your child to explore the world of dating and you tell them that this is okay. But when they're young, you say no. Because then all of a sudden, they don't know what they want. They are exploring, uh, to your point earlier, but I think they may be even exploring the wrong type of people. So if you want your children to be, and, and again, I'm going to go back and say something maybe a little controversial, but if you go back to st uh, statistically in the US consensus, it does say if you're, by the time you're in your third generation of Indians, more than likely, they're not marrying an Indian. Actually, that was, the, you know, all my friends are first generation Indians here with children who have um, either been born here or came here when they were very young. And I can tell you that the majority is marrying a non Indian. And so we are not even waiting two generations down. We are looking at a very, a very different scenario. No, no, no. The, at some point, we have to draw a line. That's not, that's not a real thing to say. Non-Indian men are not better communicators than your Indian boys brought up here. You have boys that are bad communicators. You have boys that are good communicators. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, it has to do with you and your household. If you want to raise a communicative boy, raise a communicative boy. If you don't want to raise a communicative boy, find him someone to marry yourself. But... Uh, yeah, we're saying, we're saying the same thing. But I didn't, I didn't like the, the stipulation that, that yeah. Indian American boys are not communicative. No. I think there are too many stereotypes going on. And they I'm not giving up the mic as a protest for <laughs> stating that I'm non communicative. <laughs> this is now my mic. Uh, I'm going to take this home in case anybody is wondering. Uh, why don't we take why don't we take one question from the audience or two questions? Everybody's eyes are glazing over like they don't care. So it's, it's very interesting you say this because when you, now when you talk about Indian, right? We are, you know, look at us, how many states we are. I'm from the north, my partner's from the south. Our common language is English, all right? So again, there are a lot of cultural differences just between us and we need to communicate and we do it. So that's what we're saying. The moment you assume, you're making an ass of you and me, that's how assume is spelt, right? So why don't you communicate? Why is there no communication? And that's what I'm saying is that why are you not communicating enough? And it's not about men and women, okay? So I am all for women, all right? And I am there for men. Because if there are men who are um, not there, there are a lot of women who have varied expectations, right? And also, you know what, one thing we're not talking about is interference from parents and family. That's something which we are not discussing. So where are you and what's your role as a parent or a family member of not interfering and allowing if your child uh, is in their late 20s, financially independent, emotionally independent, why are you still not cutting that umbilical cord from your son and your daughter. That's what I question. Okay, so, I, I yeah. To add, before you add to it. 
I think what, uh, what I have figured out is that though I think that my son is uh, Indian and uh, Punjabi or, you know, but the fact is that the majority of his day is spent in school. And his friends, his peers, his soccer team, his debate team, his uh, science competition team, you know, all the people who are around him influence him, the media influences them. They are not your typical Indian anymore than you would like to believe. And you can look at yourself how much you have changed from the time when you came here to uh, what we are now. Our thoughts have changed. People all over the world have changed, right? So I think that, that, is, I think that is what I think about that. I just want to say something. I want... Um, it, we're trying to tackle a huge topic in so little time, number one, which is why I think we're getting threats all over the place. Every one of the things that has been brought up deserves a few hours of conversation from my perspective. So I think I don't want anyone to get misunderstood any, um, for, from that perspective. But I think one thing that is important, to, I think we would all agree that assumptions are the enemy, right, of relating. I think that, and what I wanted to say about the blend of the East and West is this, and I think it's really important, because this is really a, a big tenet of our company, okay? So the East and the West, right? I was fortunate to be raised by parents who so respected the American culture in some ways that they chose to come here. At the same time, they so respected aspects of the Indian culture that they choose to retain part of that, right? But what they did when they came here is precisely what I encourage our clients to do, which is you identify what, what do you love about both cultures, what do you resonate with, and create your own right life based on what that is. And it's not going to be the same for everyone, OK? So that's part of your accountability to yourself, to figure out what is it that really I want to have right in, in my relationship, in the family that I'm going to create. What about the Indian culture? What about the Western culture do I want to have? And with respect to the dating, what I'll say is this. Where the Eastern culture, in my opinion, got it right is that Commitment and love, these are, not, these are not fleeting things, right? Commitment is a decision that I think you make, okay? And you make it, and once you make it, it's not that if there's abuse, absolutely. I would, get, I would never suggest anyone stay in any abusive relationship. But I also think that there's a mentality of some people that ah, I'm not really quite feeling it right now and that kind of thing, which, right, again, is antithesis, antithesis to commitment number one. Where the West gets it right, where the West gets it right is not taking a proxy like, hey, I'm Hindu, you're Hindu, so clearly we will agree on everything. Or hey, you're from this, your ancestors are from a village in South India, so are mine, so clearly. Like that is proxies which have nothing to do with the real reality of who we are as unique individuals. So I say time and interaction is important, which I think Roshan was speaking to with respect to people like not rushing to Roka in a day, but actually getting to know each other. Um, I, I, in and reference we're to trying to boil the ocean here, <laughs> so many topics. No, 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 no. I know there is there, saying something about just being. A, what I did want to add to that is, is that as we're raising our children, and I think what she says that really resonates with many of us is that yes, you do have a common ground when you marry within your own community, right? There is that common ground, but. It, the other thing is that I hear many times amongst a lot of my friends, oh yeah, but I don't want my child to marry, you know, I always tell my children, no BMWs. And BMWs is not within our community and that's the black, white, and um, Muslim community. Well, I'm sorry, that, what, why is that? Why is it that we tell our children that? And I understand the Muslim thing because there is some historical emotional attachment about the partition, and there is that, but guess what? By the third generation, all of that is probably gonna be eradicated for the Indians that grew, grow up in this country. That type of belief is no longer gonna be an emotional belief that they're gonna carry on. But the question that I do ask for many of you is, is that if you feel that Indians are the supreme of family values, ask your children. They have a lot of friends who are non-Indians. And believe you me, the whole Jewish community does this extremely well. The Jewish community, I don't know if they have apps, but they have mothers. And those mothers will find mates for their children as a community. 
They are probably the best <laughs> matchmakers out there. Actually, Sorry. I think that uh, Jewish uh, Community Center has uh, speed dating, yes. and they have, uh, they have mixers. They take it very seriously. ICC is focused on uh, dance, <laughs> <laughs> fundraisers. I think it's time to um, get that going. Oh, I hope you're not ICC. <laughs> Should we? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ask them? Yeah. Okay. Well, he's asking them yeah. if yeah. anybody yeah. wants yeah. to. Yeah. Well, uh, because they spend half of their time at home, right? They spend half their time in school. They spend half their time at home. They're looking for somebody who understands both halves of their world, yes. both halves of their life, which is maybe also a reason that. Uh, first generation kids here have a hesitancy on uh, arranged marriage, or I won't call it arranged marriage, finding a partner from India because they don't feel like they will understand their American half. They may have a hesitancy of uh, marrying a fully American partner who does, who's not Indian American because they may not understand their Indian half. They, lives in, they live in both halves of that world. Um, and so that, that's the reason that I think they would be looking for people within their community. That makes right? sense. So, Do we have yeah. other questions? Sorry, yeah. I didn't no, no, go ahead. I want to. Do we, do we want to take another question? Do we want to take another structured question? Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to repeat your question so that everybody heard it and I didn't hear the second half of it. So if you want to add on to feel free. How do you set boundaries with your in-laws when it comes to Family meetings and cultural activities? So religious, and cultural. religious and cultural activities. Because you or you may not, you or not, you could be a religious person and your in-laws may not be religious or, or rather probably vice versa. You're not religious and your in-laws are very religious. Uh, I am not qualified to speak on this, so I'm going to... I'm going to give the microphone away, but my answer to you as someone who's not qualified is don't do it, make your partner do it. They're his parents. I, I absolutely agree with Roshan that let's say that, yeah, because your partner understands 
his parents, I mean, their, I mean, whoever. So if your partner has an issue with your parents, you should be communicating it to your parents. And if your in-laws, if you are in a relationship or married and you have an issue or you know, something you disagree, you should, and that's where communication comes in also, right? And so it's your partner who should be doing it. I agree with this. And to, and to quickly give an answer that's not politically correct, sometimes just suck it up and do it. It sucks, but we all do it. Think of what he sucks up and does for your parents. Okay. Yeah. So Anja, I know Anjali's going to just, I want to just say what I do agree with from here. And I do very much agree with, because I have the lens of, I'm talking to people all the time and I'm asking these questions you guys are asking, right? If someone says, that we work with clients who are looking exclusively for Indian partners, but we also work with clients who are very open to non-Indians or even prefer non-Indians, okay? So we have the whole gamut. So when someone says to me that, I, when I have a whole question, ethnicity, what it, and when they say, I only want Indian, I ask them why. And when they say, I don't want Indian, I ask them why. The why is what. So um, I want to say, you know, number one, in terms of community, no, but, but, no, no, but in terms of your, I wanted to say that, but in terms of your question with boundaries, I think it starts when you're dating. That's why I think there is value in spending time and interaction with someone before committing. Because I will tell you, okay, the Indian men and Indian women, right, there is a mindset with some that, you know what, in terms of the family, this is the role they have with respect to decisions we make as a couple with our kids, and there's a continuum and it's wide. So I say the time to explore that and whether you're on the same page with your partner, which is what, what they're saying assumes that you're on the same page with the partner, it's when you're dating and that before you make a commitment, you, you, you have these kind of discussions. I, That's what I want to so I just wanted to add to Shalini's point, and I've been married 36 years. My husband's sitting right in front of you. He's holding a camera. And I can honestly tell you, the first time that my father said something to me about my husband that he didn't like, and he's telling his daughter, I basically told my dad one thing. I said, you know, I agree with you. I think perhaps Sushil should not have done this. And I think that maybe Sushil could have handled this slightly differently. But do you know what's going to happen now that you've shared this information with me? I'm gonna go home and probably have an issue with my husband. My father freaked out. He goes, no, 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 don't be fighting because of me. I said, then why are you telling me? This is your son-in-law. If you don't learn communication with your son-in-law, then you are, you are setting me up for failure in my marriage. So while Shalini talks about communication, I think that is where we probably have a little bit of a disagreement. This is where Indian families need to understand there is 100% communication is the key. That doesn't mean that you stop talking to your in-laws if you don't like something. Honey, tell your mother-in-law, I love you for all that you're doing. But for, and explain what is it about these rituals or these things that perhaps you're uncomfortable with. Maybe there's too many. Maybe she's doing it all the time. And you can go back to her and say, I can commit to X amount of time. But whatever it is, talk to her directly. So, uh, I think, um, I think I forget by the time I get the mic what I was going yeah. to say. I know what, you know what the thing is that I had more mother, pro I didn't have a mother-in-law, but uh, as soon as I got married and had a baby, I had big issues with my mother. My mother wouldn't listen to a word I would say. I would say, iske dood mein chini mat dalo, you know, for my baby. And my mother would put milk, sugar in the milk before giving it to Om because he, you know, she used to think this is the, isko kya pata hai? Isko kya pata hai, right? And then you think like you are, the, you know, so like my son tells me, I am, mom, I'm old, you don't have to tell me anything, right? So the problems that you have with your mother-in-law are generational, they are not specific, and they could be with your mother also. No, and I'd also say that your respect in your partner's family depends a lot on how your partner yes. handles it, and your partner's respect in your family is how you handle it. Yeah, so, your, yeah. Correct, but please don't go directly and tell your mom-in-law. There goes your relationship. So, either ways, yeah. Yeah, I agree, and and I just also recognize that you don't live in a perfect world. I think your answer is great in a perfect world where everybody has communication skills. If your mother-in-law doesn't have communication skills, you could end up in a much worse position trying to deal with that yourself. And we're not going to solve everybody's communication skills. It's just it's a nice Instagram post, but not a reality. Uh, 
No, we're not saying don't communicate, but part of emotional intelligence is understanding to what capacity the other person has an ability to communicate. Yeah, let's do one more question. Okay, I'll talk and then I'll pass it to you. So I, I think there's two avenues. I think we'll see, and we have seen a huge growth of AI-only dating apps where people are talking to uh, AI models, sometimes one model, sometimes multiple. Um, and I think that that will both be a positive and a negative. I think it can be a training ground for learning how to communicate. Uh, I think it also can be a training ground for learning how not to communicate because you're not talking to a human. Um, so I think that will be interesting. As far as non-dating AI models, the dating landscape, I think we'll see the emergence of a lot more niche dating apps because we've seen that already. People wanna feel like they're really connected to the person, whether it's based on humor, music, whether it's a Menlo College specific dating app, whether it's a Palo Alto specific dating app, South Asian specific dating app. They wanna feel like they're in an app that understands their niche. And with AI, we'll have a lot, we'll have a much larger ability to segment users uh, and to create new apps to fit within that niche. So I think we'll see that. I also, one positive statement I'll make, and then this is my last comment. I think we will see people get over that initial messaging issue much faster. Because the hardest thing in dating apps is once you match, you know this person likes you, you know you like that person, nobody wants to send the first message. The greatest thing that Bumble did for dudes was make the girls send the first message, even though they branded it as being woman forward. Every dude be breathed a sigh of relief. They, Thank God I don't have to think of what to say besides hi with a smiley face. So I think you'll get a lot of AI generated prompts that understand this person's profile to a much more great degree. Let's say you really love art history. I really love art history. The apps may be dropping in prompts for a conversation between you and I that says something like, hey, there's a Picasso exhibit going on. What do you think? And then neither of us has to get over that uh, first message boundary. No, I kind of agree with what Roshan said. You know, it could be, it could be both pro and so it could help you, um, you know, improve your communication. And, but then, you know, just to get the first conversation going, but you can't keep using it all your life. So, yeah, it can work f for you or work against you. So, yeah. yeah. Wait, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that I think is important that I, I, I don't know how relative it is. One thing that it will absolutely do is increase the number of bots on dating apps that are trying to scam people. This is a huge issue on dating apps. If you know people on dating apps, if you have young kids on dating apps, warn them. A massive issue is bots that are on dating apps and then request people for money uh, and people send money. I mean, it sounds like a joke to us when you grow up in the valley and you don't think anybody we know is doing it. It's absolutely happening. There's a lot of fraud and scams on dating apps that we should all be wary of and are only going to get worse with AI. Okay, on this happy note, this was not a very happy note, but anyway, it is what it is, and the time is over. So be careful of the of the dating apps, of the dating apps. Of the dating apps.